Mark Barrowcliffe here, fencing coach and writer. Uh, I coach at Worthing Fencing Club and I've written uh, a lot of books, historical with a fantasy twist, for publishers Galantz. Uh, just like to begin this video, it's about fencing, modern fencing versus HEMA, uh, by stating quite clearly that modern fencing is rubbish. Uh, we've allowed true sword play to wither and we no longer train correctly. So much so that if you did try to use the skills of modern fencing in a real sword fight, you would die in short order. Now, when I say that, you could be forgiven for thinking that I'm quoting historical European martial arts enthusiasts speaking about modern Olympic fencing. But no, uh, I'm quoting with a little bit of license a uh, historian alive in the ancient Roman period under Emperor Hadrian complaining about the military's adoption of uh, practice with wooden swords, a practice picked up from gladiators. How can that prepare you for a fight, he wanted to know. In fact, the accusation that the new lot aren't doing it right is as old as fencing itself, certainly if we trace fencing as we know it today, <coughs> excuse me, from the birth of the firearm, the death of armour, and the evolution of the thrust as the main mode of attack. George Silver in Shakespeare's time uh, makes this accusation about rapier. Uh, he calls it the poking fight. It's unmanly, it's ineffective, he says. The old masters make it about the newfangled practice of training in masks. The Italians in the 17th century make it about the French. And every time the modern rules change, someone says, well, the game's gone. Electric fencing, foil timings, back foot on the on guard line, etc. Now, I'm posting this video because I wanted to join a debate that I've seen on Matt uh, Easton's excellent Scola Gladiatoria YouTube channel about whether sports fencing teaches authentic swordsmanship anymore and if HEMA, historical fencing, represents true sword play much more than Olympic fencing. Uh, sports fencing no longer teaches swordsmanship, HEMA does, is the title of the video. Uh, and for those of you who are push your time, I'll summarise my response like this. <laughs> Let me expand. So uh, Matt says that HEMA is real sword play as opposed to what he calls sports fencing's game of tag, something that has corrupted the art of true defence. Well, my first question is, what is true sword play? What is a sword? Sword isn't one thing, is it? Clearly, uh, Olympic fencing has little to teach us about the use of the Roman gladius, and those training in gladius are performing a more authentic style uh, to the requirements of that weapon than Olympic fencing, no doubt. So, presumably, to make any sense, Matt's point would have to be that fencing does not teach sword play for the historical weapons it resembles, mainly rapier and small sword and sabre. Well, uh, you can write what I know uh, about Olympic sabre fencing on the back of a postage stamp, uh, so I'll go with Epe and Foil. And my take on this is that before you can say HEMA teaches truer or more authentic sword play, you have to say what authentic sword play is and what it was, and for that matter, what it might have become had duelling remained in vogue. Uh, just like a sword isn't one thing, fencing isn't one thing, never mind fencing. Sword fighting, which is distinct from fencing as a whole, sword fighting is not one thing. Uh, there are at least three distinct areas that have grown up in sword fighting since the advent of the rapier, and possibly before. Now, in this, I'm ignoring military use of the sword, uh, because I, I don't consider that fencing, uh, and I'm also uh, ignoring use of the sword as a weapon of self-defence against people armed with whatever. Uh, so, although historical records uh, certainly seem to indicate that the best defence for rapier against, say, a quarter staff is to run, run some more and keep running. Uh, but I don't know any HEMA groups who teach rapier defence against mugging, uh, but I'm sure there are some. Um, the distinct areas of sword play I identify are, one, practising for duelling, two, duelling itself, and three, sports fencing. Now, the three have fed into each other for many years, though uh, now all we have really left is practising for duelling, which seems to be where HEMA likes to place itself, 
uh, and sports fencing in various forms, from classical fencing, uh, where they don't use the electric boxes, but they still use the judges, which I've never seen, but I would, I, I would really like to uh, take part in that. It sounds great. Uh, through to the Olympic style, which is what I do, with the electric boxes. Uh, Dueling itself has completely died away since the 19th century, although there were a few, few duels uh, by crazy, brave eccentrics in the 20th century. Now, sports fencing doesn't claim to be practiced for dueling, uh, <clears throat> nor does it claim to be dueling. It's a thing of itself, though, like, say, uh, judo with fighting, it may well have applications for non-sports combat. Uh, should anyone actually be stupid enough to uh, to use a sword for that purpose. HEMA claims uh, to recreate the training practices uh, of the uh, historical cells uh, and to be a preparation for the duel uh, and a closest recreation of it. However, it seems to me that both sports fencing and HEMA sparring in the weapons that it, uh, are closest to the sports weapons are very similar and certainly when I attended a rapier club I found very very little unfamiliar from my sports fencing training some same guards same parries one or two additional ones maybe nothing that uh, doesn't come particularly naturally tactile opposition binds kudos crosses by different names stop hits and beats all there uh, people try to cut a bit uh, but that didn't require much adaptation at all now, there were a few significant differences, of course. No flesh move and the use of the backhand uh, to, to block uh, and some strange circling footwork, which I'm not sure was recommended by the Renaissance masters anyway. But I, I, anyway, I took it to be a courtesy extended by the Rapier Club to me as a visitor in order to make it easier for me to hit people on foot tempo. Uh, but there was nothing there <coughs> that I found hard, there was nothing uh, alien rather than hard, uh, there was nothing there that meant that I couldn't fence in a recognisable way absolutely immediately. Now, I personally had some problems with the scoring, uh, double hits don't count, which struck me as a missed opportunity for dual training, because you can't really say you're training for a true dual, uh, you're doing true swordsmanship if you don't acknowledge double hits. Uh, this is because if you're behind on points in a fight, for instance, a double hit is no good to you. So you must score very cleanly while your opponent can get a dirty double. And this replicates uh, a dueling situation against, say, a reckless, an angry, or even a drunk opponent who fi fixates on you and not on their own safety. Uh, and I don't understand why HEMA doesn't embrace that opportunity for more realistic practice. Uh, the club that I went to uh, derided double hits, uh, which I didn't understand, because there were duels that finished in double hits, uh, and there were those that were won by people just charging at their opponent, and had people practice more against an opponent seeking a double hit, uh, maybe a few more of them might have been alive today, or at least uninjured. Uh, in HEMA, the one that I attended anyway, uh, there was more emphasis on forms in what karate would be called kata, but again, not massively different to a footwork class. So if sparring rapier is a preparation for dueling, then so is sports fencing. Uh, it's essentially the same. However, uh, sparring rapier in the modern way is not a particularly good preparation for dueling. Neither is it a recreation of the practices of Renaissance fencing schools. It's not even particularly close. It's just sports fencing in baggy trousers. Now, it looks more like our idea of traditional fencing. I'll give Matt Easton that. But it is no nearer to it than sports fencing. And I, I love the baggy trousers, by the way, genuinely. I, it's great fun. Uh, and I loved my experience of HEMA. I, I thought it was great stuff. Uh, but the problem is, um, is this. Um, this is uh, this this is, is what makes the difference. Uh, one of one of one of these down here, the mask. Uh, and for the whole rapier period, no one used one of these while practicing. They weren't invented. Uh, and for much of the small sword uh, period, 
they weren't around either. Um, and some masters looked on wearing a mask as an insult to the skill of the person you were practicing with. There's no need for that old boy, just, uh, just don't hit him in the eye. And that changed later after quite a lot of masters got hit in the eye. Uh, also, <clears throat> people practiced often with sharp swords. And styles of practice were adapted accordingly. The hand was held high, for instance, as you can see in some engrave engravings, with the sword sloping down to avoid the face. Now, this was genuine sword play, but it was also deliberately ineffective in order to avoid injury. Or was it not true sword play because it incorporated conventions? Well, eventually, more conventions of attack and defense, defense emerged to stop people making lethal double attacks and to protect against injury which was the beginnings of sports fencing. And of course, as soon as, it, uh, as soon as conventions did emerge, people would have started looking for ways to, to use those rules to their advantage. Were these people not true swordsmen, sword people? Well, true to what? Um, I have heard HEMA people deride the conventions of sports weapons, in effect in sabre and foil fencing, the opponents taken in turns to have the right to hit, or at least must fulfill certain criteria. Uh, having moved first or, or, or made a parry uh, before the hit can be as valid in the case of a double hit. But these conventions were evolved specifically for sword practice with no masks and little protection. Using these conventions is nearer to the experience of Renaissance uh, restoration fencing schools than HEMA practitioners who fight rapier or even small sword in masks without the conventions. Though clearly, as we sports fencers are using conventions and masks, we're not that near either. So, if you want to be authentic, you've got to ditch the mask. Don't, is my advice. You'd be a crazy fool to do so. Um, I would invite any HEMA fencer who considers that their sparring is a fair recreation of sparring without masks, though clearly at their own risk and with the caveat that I'm not taking responsibility, Try training without a mask or jacket. Perhaps try training with sharps, or as if or some fencing masters suggested, with the foil of the blade uh, lowered to allow half an inch of sharp steel to protrude. And I would suggest that the style of swordsmanship you will see will change markedly from that of the sparring sessions that I took part in or that, that I've watched. It might not be as much fun, uh, but on the positive side, you'll be very in the moment and save yourself a fortune in mindfulness courses. Now, I know, in fact, with some HEMA people do practice without masks and occasionally with sharp swords. And some people who are predominantly sports fencers do as well. Uh, HEMA and sports fencing aren't separate worlds that never meet, that's for sure. Uh, but most modern people have too much regard for their safety to do this regularly, I would suggest. But if that's what you're doing is your main practice with sharp swords and no masks, then you are closer to the spirit of Renaissance sword play and training than modern sports fencers. No question and bully for you. Uh, this unprotected style of fencing is much closer to what we're likely to see in the duel as well than either modern historical fencing practice or that of Olympic fencing, sports fencing. Both systems that spar with masks are inauthentic to a point, I would say, and likely to encourage a lack of caution that will uh, not serve you in a duel. However, uh, even that statement can be questioned because like the sword and like fencing, a duel is many things and it takes into account a variety of practices. Some duels were terrible fights to the death where hideous wounds were sustained, mass armed brawls. Many were no more than people waving a sword at each other. Uh, so much so but that by the 19th century, Mark Twain recommended dueling for good health. Um, so uh, some duels went on for hours the combatants showing monumental patience or monumental respect for their own lines, and some featured enraged opponents who flew at each other on first sight with no regard for their own safety. So how does the historical fencer choose to train if they're trying to replicate the conditions of a duel? Do they train to first blood or to a kill? Do their bouts last four or five hours? Uh, what are you being authentic to? If you really want to take it that seriously, why not fight a real duel to first blood or to the death? Anything else isn't true swordplay, is it? Well, of course it is. Uh, presuming some duels, particularly in the late period, only went to first blood, isn't the modern epee, with its lightning hits to the hand and foot, 
at least a passing imitation of the sort of swordplay that would be involved in a duel to first blood. Maybe and maybe not. It might be an imitation of the sort of swordplay that would be required in these situations, but not used, because sharp steel can make an accomplished fencer look like a beginner. Now, famously, Aldo Nardi, multiple Olympic champion and noted stylist, uh, looked terrible in the duel he fought, uh, commenting it's different with the sharp one. And we can be sure that many duels were fought and won by people whose style was anything but textbook. Duelists turned up in a variety of states of sobriety, different weapons were used. Uh, in some duels, both, uh, both fencers lost fingers on their backhand, so the authentic backhand parry didn't seem to do them much good. People were in various states of excitement, anger and fear. Great technical experts sometimes froze with fear. Novices were possessed of beginner's luck. And for those who hate the, uh, the slightly out of date now, uh, arguably, sports foil flip to the back, um, there is a record of one untrained swordsman beating a skilled swordsman in a duel by using his sword like a riding whip. Now, should he have been told that he wasn't practicing true sword skills? So what prepares you for being in a duel, if that is one aim of studying the art of swordplay? I don't know. Uh, I've never been in one. And I would suggest that until you have, you, you don't know either. But I would be fairly certain that fa facing a blunt blade wielded by an opponent who is in theory sane and is at least passingly concerned for your safety, in full protective gear, sober, on even ground, in clear light, in the certainty that no spectators are going to get involved, uh, while it might be of some use, uh, is no more of a preparation than a session of modern sports foil where you learn to score a clean hit without being hit to your opponent's torso, um, where his or her vital organs are located. My, my takeaway point is this. Sword fighting has evolved. It always has evolved and it always will. As George Silver writes in Paradoxes of Defence in 1599, fencing in this newfangled age is like our fashions. Every day a change, resembling the chameleon who alters himself into all colours save white. So fences, fencing changes into all wards save the right. Sports fencing is part of the story of the sword. It grew up side by side with dueling practice and dueling itself, even from quite early on. I was happy to acknowledge that it was a practice all of its own, quite distinct from any deadly intent. Not realistic? No, but that's rather the point, because if it was realistic, many more people would die. Uh, of course, people say electric fencing has ruined sports fencing. Um, before that, you needed to make sure that your judges saw your hit. Uh, to hit clean with a clear bend in the blade. But electric fencing does no more than recreate the conditions under which a disabling hit would be scored. If a light goes on, on a sports F8, that's 750 grams of pressure, enough to drive the point of a sharp sword 10 centimetres into the flesh, or so it's said. This is what I've heard. I, I've got nothing to back that up, but this is what it said. Anyway, certainly to cut you. Um, it's more, not less, realistic than pre-electric sports fencing. Whether it's more elegant, more fun, or good as, as a spectator sport is another argument. And as someone old enough to have fenced as a boy with an old-fashioned point on an epée, three prongs, uh, I say keep your authenticity, because the scars have only just healed. Um, Scola Gladiatore uh, also criticised modern grips. Uh, even though the French grip, like the one that Matt demonstrates, haven't actually got one here because someone seems to have nicked mine, uh, have actually been used in uh, actual dueling. Uh, they said they're not true sword grips. Uh, even though uh, the designs of one like this one uh, are over 100 years old. And if we duel today, it would be with weapons very like modern sports swords, not with historical records. We'd have orthopedic grips like this one, uh, maybe flexible belt blades if we're looking to wound rather than to kill, and the weapons would be light, made from modern materials. Uh, and the orthopedic grip evolved in Olympic fencing because they give an advantage over traditional grips. They do on the piste and they would on a dueling ground. It's more realistic to use an orthopedic grip than it is a 17th century one in the modern age. Uh, because this is what people would be using today if dueling continued. 
If people still dueled with pistols, they wouldn't be turning up with matchlocks, although I can't think that pistol dueling would be all that popular in the uh, era of laser sights. Dueling today would involve using the best weapon, and that philosophy is what gave us the rapier and eventually the small sword, and then the epées de combat that were used in 20th century duels, and eventually this is what would have come along if dueling had continued. The style of combat would be different to sports fencing, uh, but we'd be using the same moves, albeit you'd think with a great deal more caution. So when we talk of authenticity and being faithful to true sword play, we have to be very careful what we mean by that. Um, true sword play isn't one thing, and it has never been one thing. Modern Olympic fencing is a continuation, and I would argue a refinement, of what has gone before. Uh, it has as much right to call itself sword fighting and as much claim uh, to true sword play as HEMA does. Thanks for sitting through this.